they sell at poetry festivals. It's called, called Against Bourgeois Art. War on the horizon, a ship with bloody sail, Andy Young slips on his Chamberlain appeasement get up he got from years listening to the CP hype Martin Luther King. Is there somebody here to record this? Hey folks. The U.S. Hey. Hey. front door. The Russian bear All charging right. through the back door. They sail. A man All right, we're live. We're live, Dr. Walker. Colonialism. Can I sh uh, share hey. a screen? Oh, wait. Yes, sir. We're, we're live. Against okay. Give me one second. This is a poem that Let me just pause this. I got all types of screens open. Greetings, Dr. Walker. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. How you got? How are you doing today? Oh, we're doing wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, as usual, we want to uh, thank you for, you know, again, graciously uh, giving some of your time and energy and thoughts and sharing with us. Um, it is um, absolutely a, uh, a pleasure for us to have someone of your um, intellectual and professional and academic uh, acumen to join us and to join our students today. Um, today, of course, we're talking about the sovereignty of the Black imagination. And I wanted to open a little bit uh, with Amir Baraka uh, against bourgeois art. Um, and this just is listen to a little bit of this. And then what I will do is um, introduce you. And then we can, I'll just turn it over to you. You have the uh, capabilities to share your screen. And I wanted to just, uh, as I, before I do this, I wanted to, you know, give space to Dr. Twin Alexander if he had anything to say or just, you know, give his greetings or whatever. Dr. Alexander, did you have oh, anything? No, it's uh, just good to be here um, sharing at least these. Uh, screen with everyone, so I won't delay further. Great. So let's go ahead and um, listen to a little bit of, we're just going to listen to probably maybe like a few seconds of this, maybe 50 seconds of this. I've played it before, but we, uh, I wanted to, you know, have something as you, to, in, to, to announce your interest, Dr. Walker. I just wanted to have something planned as we, <laughs> as we were coming in and, and, and right on cue, you popped in, but let's, Let's listen to a little bit of this here. That I usually read at poetry festivals. It's called Against Bourgeois Art. War on the horizon. A ship with bloody sail. Andy Young slips on his Chamberlain appeasement get up. He got from years listening to the CP hype Martin Luther King. Is there somebody here to record this? The U.S. being thrown out the front door. The Russian bear charging through the back door. My man suddenly clearly an apologist for new style colonialism telling us we can't fight in the U.S. I just wanted to, I just wanted to play just a little bit of that. Uh, and hopefully everybody heard that I'm, um, you know, dealing with technology and things uh, uh, here. Um, and again, I wanted to just do a quick introduction to Dr. Corey D.B. Walker, who is Wake Forest Professor of the Humanities and is jointly appointed in the Department of English and Interdisciplinary Humanities Program but he's also the, uh, the director of the inaugural Africana Studies or African American uh, Studies Program at Wake Forest. His research and teaching interests span the areas of Africana philosophy, critical theory, ethics, religion, and American public life, as well as social and political philosophy. 
Uh, he has held faculty appointments in academic leadership positions at Winston-Salem State University, of course, where we're at right now, uh, Brown University, University of Virginia, and Virginia Union University. He has held visiting faculty appointments at the Frederick Schuyler University, and that's at Jena, right? That's in Germany, uh, that, that uh, university, Union Presbyterian Seminary, and the University of, of Richmond. He is author of A Noble Fight, African-American Freemasonry and the, Strug and the Struggle for Democracy in America. He is editor of Community Wealth Building and, Recon and the Reconstruction of American Democracy. Can We Make American Democracy Work? He's and another abridged as we keep continuing, because this is an abridged continued version of my good friend and colleague, uh, comrade, Dr. Corey D.B. Walker. He is also editor of To Stand With and For Humanity, essays from the, from the Wake Forest University Slavery, Race, and Memory Project. He is editor of the special issue, issue of the Journal of Political Theology on Theology and the Democratic Futures, associate editor of the award-winning Sage Encyclopedia of Identity and has published over 60 articles, essays, book chapters, reviews, and appeared on a wide range of appearing in a wide range of scholarly journals and public and publications. And not only that, he has definitely uh, been a um, on pretty much multimedia media platforms, everything from uh, PBS to uh, to Africa World Nail Project. <laughs> so. <laughs> to NBR. So with that uh, uh, abridged and uh, hopefully uh, uh, decently in, um, decently done introduction, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Corey D.B. Walker, and we will be engaging around uh, the sovereignty of the Black imagination. Thank you, Dr. Walker. Thank, uh, thank you, Professor Pope and uh, Professor Alexander. So great to see you both, and so good to be with uh, the class again. Uh, I think we were last together in, in September uh, and now we're together in, in November. And then this month it's great to follow up on some of the themes that we discussed in September, really on the questions around critical intellectual um, and intellectuals and, and, and movements. And now we're beginning to discuss uh, questions around uh, art. Uh, and we're going to focus in on this section in African American studies around uh, the Black arts movement. Um, because if you think of um, Black critical intellectuals and the one formation, the Institute of the Black World, you may think of them as the intellectual arm of the Black freedom struggle. The Black arts movement represents the artistic and an aesthetic arm of the Black Freedom Movement. So you'll see, you'll begin to think of the Black Freedom Movement uh, coextensive with the emergence of Black studies, uh, a new critical cadre of movement intellectuals, as well as a new generation of artists with various artistic styles, aesthetic strategies, and aesthetic theories to inform uh, the position, uh, place, and, and the value of African Americans and African people of dis and people of African descent across the globe in new and dynamic ways in this moment. So today I want to want to focus on uh, the idea of the sovereignty of the Black imagination, and with that idea, I want us to to then think critically about uh, Black artistic production and what it means and how we begin to engage it and think about it in this moment uh, and how we as scholars, uh, students and scholars in, in Africana studies uh, begin to engage this protein, um, this protein and complex uh, formation. So here we're, we're opening up uh, our conversation on the sovereignty of the Black imagination uh, with some ideas of how do we begin uh, to, be, to think through the formal qualities of art that are available for analysis. Those formal qualities of form, color, composition, line, tone, texture, shape, pattern, if we are going to engage these aspects 
uh, for a formal analysis of art, then how do we approach and rethink Black art that is being developed in relation to a disciplinary formation uh, of Black studies that's also giving expression to the depth, variety, and density of Black experience, uh, and that's also beginning to engage in a deep redescription, interpretation, analysis, and judgment of the human experience. That brings up a whole host of questions for us that enables us to then think through the power and prospect of the imagination as a critical medium to begin to engage uh, this particular formation. And here we have uh, a, a image by uh, Wadsworth Jarrell, who was born in Georgia, uh, and he was a Cleveland-based artist with uh, that was Cleveland-based artist. And this picture uh, was published in Africobra, an experimental art toward a school of thought. And Wadsworth Jarrell and the artists around Africobra were not only using images, but also looking at script, graphemes, color, texture, and then beginning to reimagine what that can do in terms of articulating a message. Here you can see a number of, of, of images Come out. Of course, we see Angela Davis as that image, but we also see words like revolution that come out, sister that come out, questions that connect us to a new sense of being and belonging and a call, an inspired call to a new type of community. The idea of the sovereignty of the imagination, uh, of the Black imagination, comes to us uh, from the work of George Lamming. And I draw this out of Lamming's work, uh, not only on his interview with David Scott, but a series of conversations that Lamming had that were in, 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 the, at, in the universe, in the Caribbean, at the University of the West Indies, where Lamming began to articulate a sense, of, a sense in which the imagination can be used to empower new forms of human community, the ways in which the imagination has been shaped and transformed across space and time, and the ways in which uh, the imagination can call forth new modes of subjectivity and new modes of human being in the world. And in his conversation with David Scott, David Scott reminds us that for Lamming, the sovereignty of the imagination is not about an an either or dichotomy. It's not about sequestering creativity from uh, the question of the world, you know, the idea of art or politics. Uh, rather, the idea of the sovereignty of the imagination was to call forth a new sense of being, a new sense of relation, a new identity uh, for Black people and for Blackness that is unrepentant, that is unqualified, and that enables individuals to enter into uh, what he terms a free community of valid persons, drawing off the work uh, of George Carter, who informs Lamming of this language. And it is this idea of the sovereignty of the Black imagination that I want us to think about uh, in our conversations around the Black arts movement and the ways in which Black artists across various medium, uh, uh, screen, printing, uh, uh, the, the word, uh, the printed word be, uh, around sound began to think through new possibilities for human being and belonging and how that is particularly instructive for African-American studies. If we think of Black studies, as this formation that inaugurates a new disciplinary activity, a new form of thinking, a new strategy, new theories of connecting ideas, peoples, and institutions, then we cannot ignore and neglect uh, the vast array of artistic and aesthetic productions that occur in this moment that vitally feed and inform uh, Black studies as an intellectual project and also uh, begin to challenge the ways in which we think about Black studies in our contemporary moment. So this becomes vitally important for us as scholars to begin to, uh, begin to contemplate. If we wanna think of a framework 
uh, for this, this idea of uh, sovereignty of the Black imagination, I propose we do three things. One of the first things we have to do is begin to in, interrogate the seemingly transparent nature of the relation between the Black subject and Black cultural production. Here, this pulls on the idea that's developed by the late cultural studies theorist Stuart Hall, particularly his essay, What is This Black in Black Popular Culture? And in that essay, Hall raises this question, what sort of moment is it in which to pose the question of black popular culture? Analogously for the black studies scholar, we can begin to think about what is it in the moment of the emergence of black studies, that late 1960s moment, the moment of a creative explosion of blackness globally, the Black Freedom Movement, decolonization, the ways in which Black intellectuals and activists begin to chart a new political trajectory. We're also seeing the emergence of a new generation of Black artists developing new ideas, artistic strategies, and aesthetic practices to represent that moment. So what is it about that moment that gives us this new Black artistic and expressive culture? What is that moment? It's this question that Hall raises and the analogous question that we're raising that, in open, that enables us to open up a line of investigation into the cultural logics, uh, economic relations, political practices, as well as the aesthetic strategies and uh, ideas that form and inform particular uh, cult, uh, racially and, uh, encoded and, re and recoded cultural productions. We're also reminded that there's a deep displacement going on uh, in artistic production and aesthetic practice, a move away from uh, Europe and the embrace of the uh, global world. And in many ways, what we're seeing is a recurrence of what we saw earlier in the 20th century with the new Negro movement in Washington, DC, Chicago, and then Harlem, New York. But now we're seeing this uh, movement globally uh, and we're seeing it deepening with some interesting resonances uh, in relation to uh, the 1960s, in relation to the emergence of black studies and the ways in which we began to cognate and apprehend the world. Hall's idea uh, of connecting and thinking through what is that Black and Black popular culture facilitates a theoretical opening for us to begin to reconsider the possibilities of creating new spaces for thinking through those contestations between what constitutes the authentically Black subject and what constitutes Black cultural production across space and time. So you're going to have to, so we're going to see how we're constantly engaging in this dialectical interplay between this idea of the Black subject and the ways in which we think through Black cultural production that's central uh, to the ways in which we advance new knowledge and understanding within the Black Studies Project. We're also reminded that if we're going to think through this framework of the sovereignty of the Black imagination, we have to critically explore, examine, and interrogate the multifarious artistic, aesthetic, and expressive cultural ideas, institutions, and practices across the African diaspora. In other words, we're going to begin to engage in a broad conversation across aesthetic strategies, artistic practices, and ideas that move across uh, national boundaries that are not just 
curtained or shaped within one particular uh, national geopolitical entity, but are ideas that are afloat uh, around this imagine this imaginatory this imagination space that informs art and artistic productions. Individuals are going to borrow and blend ideas and practices across the African diaspora, as well as in uh, throughout Europe and Asia uh, and throughout the Americas to begin to engage in a new style and representation of art that speaks around a, the emergence of a new subject, an idea of blackness that emerges in the world in this moment, and that black studies can serve as a critical medium to delineate what those ideas uh, mean and how we can begin to incorporate and understand the, their manifestations across space and time. It doesn't require us to become expert uh, artistic uh, art historians or expert uh, art, uh, art uh, critics. It does require us to understand how Black Studies begins to engage Black art to then continue to extend the Black Studies project in new and dynamic ways, cognizant that all of the ways in which Black artists are presenting information informs and provides a critical architecture uh, for the discipline of African-American studies. Lastly, we're gonna also have to cultivate and nurture uh, notice we're going to cultivate and nurture. That means this is an organic uh, process and it's a continual process uh, to nurture a critical awareness and understanding of the multiple logics informing Black artistic and aesthetic practices. So this requires us to be mindful that art is not one thing and it is not static. Uh, and that we have to be attentive to the nuance, the difference, the dynamism within these artistic and aesthetic practices and look at how they're manifesting themselves across space and time and then how that flows back into creating new knowledge about the world and human experience through the critical and comprehensive study of Africans and persons of African descent. That's going to be key for Black studies to nurture that awareness, to cultivate it, and allow it to continue to grow as we have these ongoing conversations between writers, artists, scholars, activists, as well as community members in advancing the project of human knowledge. These three things enable us to develop a sort of a framework toward a sovereignty of the Black imagination and if we want to think, if we want to develop a, a representation of this framework, we can begin to look at uh, these, these ideas here. If we want to look at the sovereignty of the Black imagination, we can begin to understand we're going to have to take into aesthetics, meaning what are the philosophies and ideas that artists are using to inform their artistic productions? Uh, where do they come from? How do we begin to understand them? What are the philosophies uh, behind them? How do people begin to think through uh, the depth and complexity of the Black subject such that it's not just one thing, it's multiple things? How do we begin to interrogate and understand questions of power? How do Black artists begin to negotiate dominant artistic markets and create new opportunities for Black cultural production that evade or, and, and that marginalize those dominant art markets? What do we mean by the question of Blackness? Is Blackness one thing? Is it something that goes uninterrogated? Do we not engage it or question it? Is it just something that we see once and then say, oh, it must be replicated at all times? Or do we begin to engage it multiply and see how it changes across space and time? Is it something that's just defined from without or is it defined from within? How do individuals begin to understand it? And of course, we have to engage the question of politics. Politics takes on a, a multivalent form in this regard because it's not only the question around the external political 
the calculus, the politics, the ways in which uh, nations and, and societies and get, organize themselves, but also the particular strategies of why particular artists opt for one strategy and not another. The cultural politics around questions of authenticity. We're going to see this engage with some of the artists that we can uh, consider today, particularly some of the, the visual artists that we uh, begin to discuss today. And here we're going to, with that framework in place, now we begin to look at what are the aesthetic philosophies and ideas that are informing Black arts production uh, at the time of the, the ways in which we think that at the time of the emergence of Black studies, as well as the ways in which we're looking at um, the connection between Black studies and Black art. Here, uh, Romare Bearden uh, reminds us and uh, reminds us of the symptom, the context, if you will, of new strategies around Black artistic production. In many ways, Bearden is saying that the Black arts and Black artistic production is not absolutely encapsulated by the dominant preoccupation with absurdity or anti-art, which for, uh, for Bearden is symptomatic of the illness of the ways in which uh, America treats Amer the American Negro and the ways in which uh, the Western society sees itself. This is much like Du Bois's notion uh, and announced at the beginning of the souls of Black folk. To the question, how does it feel to be a problem? I seldom answer a word. Well, Bearden picks up on that sentiment, that theme and saying that what we're seeing right now is the very rethinking of the foundation and examination uh, that Western culture is not the only solution to all of humanity's uh, ills, nor is it the only solution to humanity's purpose. So here we have the, I did the identification of a crisis uh, in this moment, in the moment of the 1960s, and that crisis moment is a crisis moment of Western society, but it is not the same crisis as we see uh, in Black arts, uh, with Black artists and the ways in which they're thinking about society. Instead of a dominant crisis, Black artists are seeing it as an opportunity to move beyond the dominant coordinates of art. Hilton Kramer, who's uh, one of these, uh, who is a art critic at the time is writing on the pages of the New York Times uh, in 1970s, eight years after uh, Romare Bearden is writing his particular uh, quest question that, que that question that begins to challenge the hegemony of Western art. Uh, Hilton Kramer asks the question, what is Black art? Is there a Black aesthetic discernible? in the visual expression of Black art, Black American artists that distinguishes it from the work of other artists. He goes on to say, what are its characteristics? And then he uh, raises the question, if, they, if there are not any distinguishing characteristics except for you know, social ones, uh, why are there uh, exhibitions segregated? Uh, and should we have segregated Black arts? What Hilton Kramer is saying is, uh, what Hilton Kramer is arguing on the pages of the New York Times is this idea that Black art can't be segregated because it is a species of Western art. It is a species of American art. Therefore, uh, there isn't a, a discernible Black art to which others will begin to challenge that. But what he's giving voice to is this dominant idea that there is a contestation around Black art and Black aesthetic production. And that contestation is not purely within the artistic realm. It is also impinges on the question of politics and the questions of dominant artistic policy around quote unquote segregated exhibitions or exhibitions by black artists only. That's going to be vitally important. What Hilton Kramer raises is a critical question, uh, not only for our understanding, but also for the context in which we're engaging uh, the question of black art in this moment. 
And we have one last uh, one last quote that sort of orients us and guides us in this moment, and that's uh, by A.B. Spellman. And really, A.B. Spellman is reminding us that the Black Arts Movement is not just one simple thing. It is multiple. There is no, um, uh, no idea of one singular individual that is guiding all of this artistic, this Black arts movement. Uh, and it is not only heterodoxical in its approach, it is varied in the way in which it's manifesting itself. This is important for the Black studies scholar to then track the ways in which various artistic ideas and productions are instantiated, and then how we begin to trace those ideas that can inform so many other uh, artistic expressions. Spellman writes that the Black arts movement was not like the, a school of European modernism in art. It was not promulgated with a simple manifesto that codified its purpose, aesthetic, method, and the academy that it sought to overthrow. To be sure, there were programmatic statements. I mean, uh, you can look at Larry Neal's uh, statement on uh, toward, you know, black, toward a Black aesthetic. You can begin to think through the ways in which even Amira Baraka, uh, Amira Baraka articulates uh, an aesthetic against bourgeois art uh, that we heard uh, prior to uh, our class session today. But there's not one singular idea, not the I manifesto that then all artists are, uh, cling around. In many ways, there are many smaller manifestos. We saw one from Romare Bearden uh, with the group Spiral that begins an, an idea around art. We're gonna see it also with the Kamoinge Collective. We're gonna see it multiply uh, expressed. We see it, of course, with Tony K. Bambara and the way she uh, moves around the, the, uh, the written word with the Black woman in anthology. We'll also see it with the LA Rebellion, the, that group of uh, artists and filmmakers uh, out at UCLA and the ways in which they begin to strategize around Black film and Black representation in film. But Spellman really underscores uh, something uh, that is vitally important for us to understand, that there was no uh, simple, uh, one directional, unile unilineal uh, manner in which the Black Arts Movement went. It was not just one thing, it was multiple things. The key idea here is that if we think about the Black Arts Movement, we have to understand that the result of it was a heterodoxical and aesthetically plural array of art that ranged from abstraction to social realism, revolutionary screed to diasporan idealism, historical reflection to projection of possible worlds with all the stops in between. These are, this is the idea that's important for the Black Studies student and Black Studies scholar to remind us that it's never just one thing. Blackness is multiple, it's deep, it's varied, it's multitudinous in the ways in which it's represented and the ways in which artists engage it. That's going to be vitally important. If we begin to understand that, we can begin to think through and see the ways and comprehend rather, the ways in which artists are creating new knowledge born of the experiences of continental and diasporic Africans and the ways in which they apprehend those experiences in and through various artistic forms and various media. Here uh, we have this uh, interesting screen print from Barbara Jones Hogu, who joined with Donaldson, Jarrell, and uh, Williams in the Africobra movement. Barbara Jones in this uh, statement connects this idea of form. Notice the, the strong lines. Notice the texture. Notice the ways in which we have these faces of individuals that also reference certain ideas around African masks that in inform her artistic production. But most importantly, she wants her art to make a statement. Here she says, our art must communicate to its viewer a statement of truth, 
of action, of education, of conditions, and of a, and a state of being to our people. We wanted to speak to them and for them by having our common thoughts, feelings, trials, and tribulations express our total existence of a people. Here, this idea of unite that moves uh, in from this one, that moves from this small point all the way up to this large point to actually begin to encapsulate the entirety of a people, everyone with the arms raised, fist in the air, united in purpose and in struggle, the creation, if you will, of a people, referencing uh, Africa, the Ethiopian uh, Ankh there. But what you're also seeing is art as a statement, thinking through the potentials of art, what this particular group, uh, Africobra, connects, this member of of this group of Afri Africoba connects a collective artistic practice with an individual aspiration and desire to utilize art to make a statement, not to just engage one thing, but many things, but also not to, also, not to disqualify the depth and dynamism of this layered and textured screen print to understand that artistic craft also informs the statement of art itself. So we have to begin to think through complexly what these uh, possibilities are. And of course, when we think of these groups, groups like Afrikober, artists like Barbara Jones Hogu, we're reminded that there are new possibilities for art to communicate deep messages about who African-American people are, the ideas of their interconnectedness globally, as well as how to begin to express the multiple feelings uh, and the deep humanity of Black folk. Here we have uh, Ben F. Jones' uh, work here, Untitled. It's a watercolor um, based on a, a, a color pencil and ink. It's a mixed message collage. If we think of collages, of course, the great collages that we think of immediately is Romare Bearden. But Ben Jones, his work seeks to connect us in a casual manner to disconnected concerns, right? These ideas of spirituality, of politics, of social life, the ideas of the ways in which we understand that as individuals, we are connected to a broader cosmos, a broader universe. But in many ways, we're also beginning to think through the ways in which we can layer those experiences and never lose the individual never lose the idea that Blackness is not some over-encompassing oppressive formation, but it enables individuals to begin to express their deep individuality that is insoluble and in, cannot be diluted any, in any way, shape, or form. So we begin to look at this mixed medium uh, this, yeah, this, this mixed media collage and the way in which he's putting it together along with the ideas that are behind it. The beauty of this reminds us that whether these images and express, expressions are positive or negative, they, con they consolidate to create the totality of the individual, who we are without denying or negating aspects of who we are, the ability to synthesize all of those ideas, all of those experiences, all of those expressions. That's key for the Black Studies scholar because it enables us to understand the depth and complexity of Black subjects, Black culture, and um, formations around the Black community. Here we have a, a piece uh, around Jeff from Jeff Donaldson. Uh, he, he's part of that Afrikober collective. Uh, and the idea with Donaldson, uh, there's a statement around uh, Jeff Donaldson that uh, he was awake while other, people's, while other people were asleep. Jeff Donaldson connects this idea uh, of family. 
Uh, and this idea of connecting, this generational connection, the individuals in, of course, uh, in, in the painting, but also individuals right in the center of it. How do we connect across temporal boundaries? How do we think across time? How does the Black Studies student and scholar think of Black experience across time? How does it also think across space? Here is the Ankh again, that referencing that the totality of Black experience is not just within uh, the U.S., it is also encompasses and shapes around uh, the continent. Spirituality is a deep concern uh, in the pictures around uh, the members of Afrocobra. And we're constantly beginning to think through what those opportunities are. And we have to constantly think through how we begin to understand that within the question of the African diaspora. Here we have Casper Banjo, uh, who was born in Memphis, Tennessee, and he understands the experiences of racism, anti-Black racism, in a unique and in, in a unique manner. And of course, these these handprints that are left there, uh, Banjo reminds us that that when we think through the question of racism, we're thinking through the, these imprints of these hands, the imprints of the human, that the idea uh, of, of racism is a deeply human one. We're also reminded that what Banjo reminds us of is that we have to look at the ways in which texture reminds us of the deep, complicated textures of racism, that it's not just one thing, it's multiple things. As the Black Studies scholar, we're constantly thinking through all of the ways in which racism manifests itself to deny that the very texture and complexity of being human in the world. Casper uh, Banjo, uh, was, who was considered uh, a gifted and uh, deeply gifted artist, he would eventually move, uh, make the San Francisco Bay Area his home, more specifically Oakland. Uh, and he would unfortunately suddenly die in 2008. But he reminds us that his works uh, not, only, not only challenge our ideas, but it also enables us to move beyond uh, the ways in which we think of purely Black art and its representational value. Here we have the uh, Kamoinge Collective, a picture of uh, the members of the Kamoinge Collective that's organized by uh, Lewis Draper. Uh, Lewis Draper is a, a native of Virginia. Uh, um, what he was, he was, um, he, no, Lewis Draper went to Virginia State University, I'm sorry. Um, and at Virginia State, he began and to experiment with ideas around art. And all of a sudden, uh, it, he began to look at the ways in which you can bring these uh, art, th this art together. Uh, Lewis Draper um, uh, uh, developed the uh, Kamoinge Collective uh, and brought together these photographers in the 1960s. Uh, when you look at the Kamoinge Collective, uh, they take their name and image uh, from uh, Jomo Kenyatta's Facing Mount Kenya. Jomo Kenyatta being uh, the independent leader of an independent Kenya. And of course, when you think of Kamoinge, you're thinking of a group that works together. Notice we're talking about collective ideas, collective identities, and collective practices. Spiral, Afrikobra, Kamoinge. Here are groups of artists working together to give expression to these new ideas around Blackness, Black art, uh, Black subjects, uh, and uh, Black people, in this, as well as globally, constantly referencing uh, the ideas of uh, Africa and the ways in which that, uh, the ideas of Africa inform us uh, across the African diaspora. 
There, we're also going to pay attention to one particular member of the Kamoinge Collective, Ming Smith. Notice she's the only woman in the collective. And of course, Ming Smith, is con she continues to work and produce great art. Her work informed and influenced so many other um, uh, Black artists, including uh, Arthur Jaffer, uh, who did the cinematography for um, for Julie Dash's uh, classic film, uh, Daughters of the Dust, that's been recently reissued. It is the way in which she captures the everyday elegance and beauty uh, in, in her photography that Arthur Jaffer uh, sought to capture in his work, uh, in his cinematographic work with uh, Daughters of the Dust. Here is one of her uh, pictures. Uh, here's one of her uh, uh, works. This one is When You See Me Coming, Raise Your Window High. This is a, really about everyday African-American life in the city. Uh, in many ways, uh, Ming Smith, she's the only member uh, of the Kamoyenge Collective. She was born in Detroit, raised in, in Cleveland. Her work has been collected by a number of uh, important uh, museums and uh, has been also part of a number of great exhibitions held at the Whitney, the Modern Museum, but the elegance of her eye. And really, this group of photographers are going to have to um, combat the idea that photography is an art. Here we have the ways in which they they're using the medium of photography to articulate a new form of, uh, of, of Black art in this moment. We think of great photographers like Gordon Parks having to negotiate this, Roy DeCarava. Uh, we think of movement of the Black image from the daguerreotype in the 19th century to the ways in which Black photographers are using some of the most advanced uh, uh, cameras and equipment in the 20th century to continue to produce Black art. This is the way in which those particular techniques, the uh, technology enable black artists to begin to articulate this new sense of ideas uh, of what blackness is, how uh, black art can re represent the everyday, how everyday individuals can become objects of art, and then how these particular artistic um, uh, forms and artistic productions can engage the everyday in every everyday spaces. Uh, it's interesting, Ming Smith uh, talks about her first um, exhibition being in a beauty salon, uh, because where do Black artists, particularly Black female artists, uh, present uh, their work? What exhibition space? Often it's in the unique, exhibition spaces that are in Black communities, beauty salons, barber shops, the ways in which individuals uh, utilize churches and other uh, gathering spaces. They become the artistic spaces, and it also enables Black artists to begin to launch uh, critiques of dominant museum practices, dominant curatorial practices. And for Black studies scholars, we begin to look at those movements to begin to, un to challenge regimes of knowledge, power, and authority, even in the art arts world. Here we have an image uh, from uh, revolution works from the Black arts movement that represented the Black arts movement to a new generation in the 21st century. So we see, of course, that Wadsworth Durrell uh, image that started our uh, particular conversation, but it also enables us to reintroduce these ideas to a new generation of, of students. The best thing about Black studies is that it's not just an idea that is static or an idea that emerges all the ways with the contemporaneous or always with the new, but it's the ways in which ideas move across space and time and how those ideas are represented, reinterpreted, uh, and rethought by Black studies students and scholars and the ways in which it offers us a new language new categories, and new frameworks to begin to engage uh, in Black studies. And indeed, Tony K. Bambara underscores this uh, with her 
particular, in her unique way, uh, in the preface to the Black Woman in Anthology, uh, particularly when she writes, our art, protest, dialogue, no longer spring from the impulse to entertain or to indulge or enlighten the conscience of the enemy. White people, whiteness or racism, men, maleness or chauvinism, America or imperialism, depending upon your viewpoint and your terror. What Tony Kay reminds us of is that at this moment, in the 1970s, it's no longer a question of defending Black humanity uh, in all of its depth, density, and variety. It is of articulating this humanity outside of these ideas of a dehumanizing racism, the ways in which capitalist political economy has instrumentalized life and Black existence, and outside of the constrictive norms of mainstream, uh, well-stream culture. In other words, Blackness now emerges fresh and new in the moment to begin to articulate a new sensibility about the Black subject, about Black people, and about Black possibility, coextensive with the emergence of Black studies. Then we have the emergence of Black artists, particularly Black women artists, who are pushing the boundaries of Black arts to take into account the, uh, the, the particular positions, ideas, experiences of Black women. And here in this, uh, the 1972 exhibition, Where We At, Black Women Artists, we find this emergence of Black women artists who are not only developing new ideas and strategies around Black arts, they're extending those ideas that we see, uh, that we read about in Tony Cade's uh, work, The Black Women in Anthology, to multiple media to begin to think through how do we begin to represent uh, Black women's experiences, ideas, and the depth and complexity of Black women artists? So we can't think of Black arts along a gendered uh, logic. Of course, the masculinist language and imagery of the Black arts movement is always already contested by Black women artists at the same time. And here we have the famous image of Faith Ringgold and Michelle uh, Wallace protesting at the Whitney Museum. The idea that Black artists should receive less pay, less ex exhibition space. And of course, when we think of this moment, we're also thinking of the moment where new exhibition spaces are opening up uh, for Black artists, particularly uh, the Studio Museum. We're also thinking through the ways in which Black artists are creating new uh, new venues for Black arts for Black art representation. And we're also looking at the ways in which Black artists are developing uh, new artistic strategies and practices. Here, this, the idea of revolutionary sisters, this mixed media uh, presentation that's on wood, that provides depth and texture, but also the revolutionary image is no longer uh, the man, but it is the revolutionary sister with uh, those bullets right around uh, the bandolier, uh, right around uh, the belt area. So we begin to look at how we begin to represent uh, these revolutionary figures. And of course, here's Faith Ringgold's uh, piece uh, for the Women's House that gives us all of the images of women who are then captured and representing the image of, of women, not just in one mode, but in multiple modes. And of course, Faith Ringo gives expression to uh, a number of these different themes around uh, Black arts, particularly her work uh, with the Black Panther Party. And of course, Faith Ringo opens up new spaces uh, for African-American artists, African-American women artists who want to open up uh, ways of thinking uh, about uh, Black arts and for the Black study scholars, it challenges us to move our modalities, to move our categories, to capture up, to capture, to catch up to where the artists are. Here is an artist that all of you should know, particularly at Winston-Salem State, because you have one of Mel Edwards' uh, famous pieces on the campus, Southern Sunrise. 
And Mel Edwards works with uh, metal and he um, um, wells steel. And Mel Edwards was also a, a college athlete. But Mel Edwards' piece, Welded Steel, utilizes questions around shackles, questions around uh, the iron of, of, sh of shackling uh, enslaved individuals to begin to think through what does this texture mean when we begin to create it anew and Mel moves towards abstraction uh, in his art. Just as we saw with A.B. Spellman, it's not only questions around social realism, it is also abstraction that captures Black artists in this moment. And Mel, work, and Mel works through this particular medium. And when you go out onto the Haynes Garden, right in front of K.R. Williams Hall, you can see the big disc uh, where um, Mel Williams' installation, Southern Sunrise, is. And that's a key point that uh, was installed in the early 80s, but it continues Edwards' uh, strategies and his aesthetic ideas that are born out of this 1960s moment. Here we have uh, Sam Gilliam's uh, piece. Sam Gilliam uh, is an abstract artist, uh, an abstract painter. Uh, he's one of the most successful uh, abstract painters, uh, abstract African-American artists. Uh, but when Gilliam was really part of, when Gilliam first arose to prominence, he was part of what we term the Washington DC color school. Uh, and he had a really uneasy relationship with the Black Arts, Black Power movement. And of course, his abstract representation doesn't absolutely coincide with the thrust of uh, the representational thrust of the Black Arts, uh, Black Power movement. But Gilliam is uh, one of the finest artists uh, uh, working at the time. And he begins to develop uh, a, an expressive cultural landscape of Black art in the abstract realm that also references uh, the violence done to Black bodies, particularly the Reds uh, in this Red April 1970, uh, this Red April 1970 uh, print. Here we have uh, the front piece of in, in combo, the black, uh, black from Black Art South, and Black Art South connects us with so many formations across the South. Uh, when we think of Black Art South, we're always uh, we're also thinking of the way in which the geography of a freedom principle is inaugurated, the ways in which it takes a shape uh, in New Orleans and the ways in which it moves across uh, various multiple media, the ways in which it connects with the written word. Of course, we also think through uh, the free Southern theater, the way it moves across uh, artistic formations. So we're not just thinking one thing, we're thinking multiple things and the artists are helping us push our thoughts in that direction. So here we, we end with uh, uh, Gerard Williams' uh, Nation Time, his acrylic on canvas, and it enables us to open up for a dialogue around this idea of the sovereignty of the Black imagination. And again, if we think of that sovereignty and we think of the Black arts movement in relation to Black studies, it enables us to think through the new possibilities that are open for the Black Studies scholar when we begin to reconsider some of the formal qualities of art that are available for analysis uh, and how they are then rethought, remixed, and, and develop a new Black art idea, new Black art strategy. Uh, and it also enables us to remind ourselves that we must rethink uh, how we do description, analysis, interpretation, and how we begin to judge Black artistic production across space and time. We recognize that Black artists, Black uh, aesthetic strategies and practices are not uh, simple or linear. They're not one-dimensional. It's not one way. But instead, as with Black studies, it is multiple. And we have to begin to look up the ways in which they're intermingled with and mixed up by a multiplicity of ideas and experiences. So we have to begin to think, if we want to take up this idea of the sovereignty of the Black imagination, to look at questions of 
aesthetics, along with questions of ethics, questions of experience, along with questions of epistemology such that we approach these formations with the uh, sensitivity, with the nuance, with a conceptual apparatus that can enable us to really understand the depth and density of these formations, as well as how they influence strategies across space and time. To begin to think not only the art, the practice, but also the depth and complexity of meanings and possibilities that are possible uh, when we cultivate and nurture this sovereignty of the Black imagination. So with that, I'll open up to any questions, thoughts, or ideas. Thank you, Dr. Walker. Uh, I just wanted to, uh, you know, this, this, this was a very, very robust, very, very uh, textured uh, presentation that, uh, well, well, conversation that you really allowed us uh, to uh, develop multiple nodes of understanding and strands that we can pull on. And we generally have um, just only a few minutes. I wanted to see if uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Torn Alexander, had anything. Uh, if he did not, I just had one particular uh, thought that I wanted you to kind of, uh, you know, kind of riff off of, uh, but I'll just turn it over to uh, Dr. Alexander real quick if you had anything. Yeah, um, just a wonderful um, presentation. I guess the, I have, you know, just kept occurring to me, um, you know, the advantage of having you um, kind of walk us through this, um, this artwork and, you know, explore, in, you know, the meaning, significance, calling attention to these various aspects. I'm just wondering, um, you know, how do we nurture, encourage, um, a facility to a literacy uh, to engage this kind of thing. And I'm particularly thinking of it as far as, you know, for some of us, for, for a lot of the students, this is their first exposure to this. And I'm also concerned about how this is able to break through, for lack of a better term, the noise of, you know, the mass media, uh, you know, images, pictures that are, you know, labeled as black or African or African American. Um, yeah, I, I think that is critical because what, what we have to do is give students a facility that Black folk are creating art. And it's not just within the popular realm uh, that Black art is produced, that Black art is produced across a number of different spaces. And what we have to do as students and scholars of African American studies, of Black studies, is to develop the requisite language uh, concepts and frameworks to understand that multiplicity and that range in which Black arts and Black artistic productions are produced and are developed. So it requires us to introduce these ideas and these historical frameworks such that students can then make sense of the ways in which they're being deployed in our contemporary moment. It's not only uh, the ways in which it's being produced across social media platforms or in popular media platforms, but it is also drawing off a stock of images, ideas, and strategies that, are in, that have been informing Black art production and Black aesthetic uh, production across centuries. So give you an example. Um, on, there's a new conversation uh, around Nella Larson's uh, passing uh, on Netflix. Mm -hmm. And here is this text that's almost a hundred years old. It comes to, uh, it comes to film 
And this film is shot in black and white. And there is this deep conversation around not only this text, uh, but also the filmic strategies, the formal qualities of the film, but also the literary criticism around Larson's book, particularly the literary criticism of Deborah McDowell, uh, as well as uh, the work of Thaddeus Davis to begin to bring to life this text once again that's seen a new life in film. So what scholars have done, particularly uh, Black women scholars uh, who have engaged in this conversation, uh, predominantly because they were the pioneers in doing so much of the work uh, around this text, what you're also seeing is the nuance of their ideas that are also influencing the film criticism, uh, as well as the ways in which we begin to rethink that text in the 21st century. So what our students get to see is an instantaneous model of uh, a new film in 2021 that takes up an old text, 1928 passing, that takes up a perennial issue questions around color, questions around uh, class, questions around identity, and that also enables us to then look at the ways in which scholars begin to engage this text and its filmic representation, uh, not only in, in the past, but also now. And we have the beauty of seeing, uh, not only reading Deborah McDowell's uh, astute criticism, but also hearing uh, Deborah McDowell uh, provide a deep and detailed critique of the film, as well as the ways in which it wrestles with those perennial themes. And of course, we also uh, see this in uh, some of the, the newer work, of course, we see it uh, around uh, some of the work, the reissuance of Julie Dash's uh, re, uh, Daughters of the Dust, uh, Holly Garima's uh, work that's now being uh, celebrated in Hollywood, and Holly is uh, standing back a little bit from all of the celebrations, but continuing the work. But what we're, it's an opportunity for us to inform our students uh, and also to provide them, equip them with the languages, ideas, and conceptual frameworks such that they can engage these public conversations from a critically informed Africana studies uh, perspective so that these ideas are not ancillary uh, to, their, to contemporary artistic production. They are very much central to it and our students are very much important conversational partners uh, in this uh, ongoing dialogue. I think that's a, a key way in which we move these ideas, uh, that we continue to translate these ideas uh, intergenerationally and continue the conversation. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you for that. And and again, we're gonna we're gonna try to close this out. Uh, with, um, this very very important, just one of many conversations, right? This is not one of the things that I that I love about your presentation, but I also like the way that we think about Africana studies. And you mentioned this in the presentation about Black studies or Africana studies not being static, not being being in a particular place, which brings us you know, to a preoccupation of mine, but also, you know, we talked about this, we've been talking about this for years, about this notion of time. Black art, as I'm, as I'm looking at this, and, and, and I try to encapsulate, I have uh, two pages of notes and they're all over the place, but I try to encapsulate my comments into, when we think about Black art, we think about Black art as marking time, but simultaneously breaking the concept of time. And so with that being said is, is that from what, I'm, from, what, from what I understand about Black Studies as a framework, because I love your framework, because you talked about how do we capture this moment? You know, we're always capturing moment. This is something that is, that is integral uh, to an, an African or an Africana way of understanding. How do we understand the moment, not just in a static space, but as a mark within which we can use to map forward and backward on a timeline, right? How we, can, how we can look back, but also see the future simultaneously. 
And so with that being said, um, you in your in your framework, you, I just want to because I have many questions, but let's just, let's just end it on this, or uh, your interrogation, and I, and I believe the framework, the first one was to interrogate the transparent nature of the authentically, authentically Black subject plus Black cultural production in the moment. Could you, could you talk about that in the context of what I kind of just basically said is the way that Africana said, African thought doesn't look at time in a linear fashion. It, it, it is a, is a very expanded, it's, it's marking time at the same time, kind of breaking this limited notion of time. Would you say that, you know, Black art is really about, when you talk about the sovereignty of Black and Nigeria, could you, could you, is it really about understanding the future? Is it really just projections of the way that things could be, or that things should be? Well, in, in that formulation, we still continue with that linear conception because future is something that's out there, right? So if we want to, if we take the framework, you know, that those ideas, those three particular struts uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a manner in which we want to engage uh, time, uh, time, then we realize that Time is not just unidirectional. It is beginning to think almost simultaneity across uh, different spaces. Um, and it also reminds us that we have to interrogate and entertain the question that Stuart Hall raised. You know, what is this moment? Uh, what sort of moment of this? What sort of moment is this that we pose this question around Black art? And for Black studies scholars, uh, the question that, that Torin raised about our contemporary moment is, you know, what is it about this moment where the visual is so hegemonic, right? Where it's so saturated that everyone has a camera, um, that the visual begins to tell a story without a language yet attendant to the very uh, nature of the visual, that we seem to always, we already understand that. Um, I think it's a moment in which we need, we can have a, a chance to step back, think through uh, what, you're, what you're gesturing toward, the flexibility and fungibility uh, of the temporal and make that a conscious element uh, in our theoretical and methodological practice to then use that as a theme of uh, pedagogical practice to have uh, our students think through uh, the ways in which time is represented across a typical linear uh, horizon and then engage in questions of memory and the ways in which it can be re uh, represented in and through different media. And that's what we see uh, in that Black arts movement, how memory is representing these images and how the artist is utilizing particular aesthetic strategies and ideas that then collapse all of this into the work of, a, uh, the, work of an, uh, the work of art, that it is not just one thing, that there are multiple ideas at work and at play, such that the, you know, the, the, the dominant, the screen print from Barbara Hogu to uh, the works in, in steel and welding uh, with Mel Edwards, we have to develop a subtle language and vocabulary to articulate both, but we also understand that there's a moment in which both emerge and as a Black studies scholar, we are not uh, becoming you know, art critics. Instead, we're trying to understand uh, how Blackness is being represented and then how artists are providing us with new languages, ideas, and frameworks to begin to articulate that. And it enables us also to engage in those deep conversations with artists, writers, uh, community activists, and other individuals who enable, who enable us to have this wide ranging conversation on knowledge production and reproduction. That enables us to then develop a facility 
that's important for our students to, to gain um, mastery of in their journey in Black studies. Um, I'm by no means, you know, an art critic. I work and wrestle with artists and their ideas. Uh, I read them immensely uh, simply because uh, for my intellectual practice, they provide me with a language and a vocabulary to understand the depth and complexity of the human condition across space and time. And that's what we're wrestling with. And that's really what we're trying to uh, teach our students how to engage in that ongoing practice um, and that ongoing uh, dialogue. And time becomes a constitutive element of that and the ways in which artists are wrestling with that conception or wrestling with conceptions rather of time that are not simple that are not simple and uh, unidimensional, but are complex and really enable us to open up uh, the idea, I open up to new ideas about human experiences that are not just uh, one simple unilineal direction. Well, thank you for that. And, and uh, with that being said, um, we want to again, uh, you know, just, you know, thank you for your time and thank you for your generosity as you are, are always um, open to engage around a lot of these particular questions that we all attempt to work on on a day to day basis. Once again, thank you very much for spending time with us today. Hey, thanks so much. I enjoyed right. the conversation. This is a poem that I usually read at poetry festivals. It's called Against Bourgeois Art. 